with the talk of Liz Morris, and then there will be Alex Mondinger, and then again Liz Morris, so maybe she can have the possibility to go and sleep a little bit since she has catch, caught this cold. The, her first talk is, should we include MRI in the follow-up of women who have gone undergo, uh, undergone breast conserving surgery? Okay, no, I think I'm good, thanks. Thanks. Okay, so, um, so these days, uh, women who are survivors of breast cancer um, um, really count in the millions worldwide, and this will undoubtedly increase in the future. So that cancer, breast cancer, has really become almost like a chronic disease, um, and uh, so we have a lot of survivors. Um, we know that these women are at increased risk for developing a second breast cancer. Um, however, most uh, screening programs only recommend screening mammography currently for these uh, patients. Um, and uh, there's no recommendations uh, really other than um, adding screening ultrasound. And so what I'm going to just sort of look at is does add, adding MR um, uh, add anything to surveillance in these patients? Um, we know that mammography is not a perfect test. Um, it has, we know it has lower sensitivity in BRCA patients, um, patients who are young with dense breasts. And it's even more complicated um, in patients who are survivors and who have post-surgical changes on the mammogram. Uh, it's we know it's compromised. It's more difficult to read the mammograms in these patients. Um, so there might be a possibility for MRI, um, and, but it's time-consuming, and we're not really sure that adding MR um, really does uh, benefit um, the patients. Uh, how many of you actually would consider um, patients with a history of breast cancer to be high risk, like 20% or more? Right. Because it, it right, okay, so I'm going to get to that. Um, so, right, so they don't, they don't just by the history of personal history of breast cancer actually reach that 20% mark that we can say, okay, they are high risk and they warrant uh, further evaluation with, um, with uh, MR. Um, we know that accuracy of mammography and personal history of breast cancer has a much lower sensitivity um, and in these patients, and, and also with mammography in these patients, there's a higher interval cancer rate um, despite more evaluation um, and a higher um, underlying um, uh, cancer rate as well. So does early detection of what, what, what really we want to know is does picking up these second primaries um, uh, really affect mortality of these patients? Um, there used to be, when I was training, um, it used to be said, well, who cares if you pick up a recurrence early or late? It's a recurrence and it's not going to affect the overall mortality of the patients. But there's been a big change in thinking along those lines and that it does um, impact the mortality when we pick up these um, second primaries, um, whether it's in the ipsilateral breast or the contralateral breast. And um, this was a nice paper, well, it's uh, by Nemet Husami, um, that did show that, um, that in symptomatic women um, versus uh, asymptomatic women, um, she had here ipsilateral breast recurrence in about 450 and contralateral breast in 589, and um, um, that uh, that the uh, detection on um, that asymptomatic cancers detected on mammography were um, smaller than that for symptomatic. Um, the early stage tumors were more frequent in asymptomatic, and fewer uh, women with asymptomatic um, presentation. Um, had no metastases. Um, so in her, in her con one of her conclusions in the patient is detection of the second breast cancer when asymptomatic, that is with screening, um, leads to detection of early stage cancer and can improve survival in about a quarter to a half um, of patients. 
So I think as radiologists, for me, I feel that it is important to pick up a second primary um, when it's early and asymptomatic. Now, if you look at the um, American Cancer Society guidelines, um, they think, at least when these were written, that there is insufficient evidence at this time to recommend screening MR for people with a personal history of breast cancer. However, this is taken on a case-by-case -case basis on many centers, and um, there are centers who do screen patients with um, breast cancer history and those that do not. Um, we looked at our experience with screening breast MR with personal history, and we found that there was an incremental um, cancer detection rate in um, patients with only a personal history of breast cancer. We actually excluded any other risk factors. So these women don't have family histories. They're not BRCA um, patients. And I'm on, my, I'm on auto advance again. But anyway, okay. So they have absolutely no um, cancer history. Uh, we found that MR detected an additional 10 cancers in the 144 patients that were in this cohort. Um, and um, the PPV of biopsy was 40%. And interestingly, in our study, um, the majority of cancer were detected within the first three years of screening. And so this is what it looked like. Um, personal history of breast cancer with screening MR, and these are the years of screening, and you can see that the vast majority of um, cancers that we picked up on MR were um, early uh, recurrences. So these are probably due to incompletely re uh, resected uh, breast cancer, um, and this is probably due to um, brand new um, primaries. Um, this is a graph looking at the years from the original cancer to the new cancer. This is uh, um, within the first of uh, six years, the majority of cancers were picked up, but we did pick up cancers um, uh, going over a uh, 10 year follow up. What was, we found was that in patients who had a preoperative MR exam, there were fewer um, cancers um, on the subsequent screens once they were treated than if they had no preoperative MR. And I think that speaks to the fact that if you have a preoperative MR and you define the extent of disease, they get the surgical treatment that they need, um, then their recurrence rate obviously is probably going to be lower. Um, so this sort of speaks to um, completeness of workup um, at the get-go uh, from when they, um, they're treated. And that was particularly true for these early recurrences, as we were talking about. So in the patients who did not have a preoperative MR um, on screening MR for personal history, we were able to pick, um, we picked those up in the first three years. And the types of cancers we picked up were small. Um, uh, they were uh, under, a, the, the median size was under a centimeter. Uh, there was less than 20% had axillary, axillary node metastases, um, and the histology um, of the prior breast cancer really had no impact on whether or not we picked a cancer up. Um, this is not a patient in this cohort, this 144 patient cohort. This is actually another case of a woman with a um, 51-year-old who had a history of um, uh, 1.4 centimeter invasive ductal cancer that was surgically excised with negative margins and negative sentinel nodes. And she had dose dense ACT with radi whole breast radiation therapy. And she never had a preoperative MR. And now she comes to us because she's young and um, her oncologist wants her to be screened with MR. And she has dense breasts. Um, so this is her very first initial screening MR. You can see the surgical changes from the lumpectomy here with the clips. Our surgeons put in clips, so it makes it easy to see the surgical site. And then just anterior to the surgical site, you can see this bilobed mass right here. So it's obviously suspicious. So we, um, we looked with ultrasound, couldn't see something that we thought was... Um, definitely this area because it's very close to the um, surgical site. So we did an MR biopsy and you can see here's the trocar coming in right next to this area and this is after the biopsy and there's air um, at the biopsy site. 
and our MR biopsy came back as atypical duct hyperplasia. Now, um, for MR, it's the same with every other um, biopsy uh, 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 modality, that um, if you get ADH, you need to, to go on to surgery, and this patient did, and she um, had high-grade um, DCIS at surgery. And you can see we, we, we put a marker in when we did the MR biopsy, and that's the marker, uh, and we just localized it for the surgeon. So you can imagine this patient who just finished her treatment for breast cancer. She went through all that chemotherapy, the radiation therapy, and now we've just diagnosed residual cancer in her breast. Um, that probably wasn't treated adequately uh, from, the, uh, from the original surgery. And so in um, the States, um, if this happens, in general, this means she needs a mastectomy. Um, so it means that treatment failure, and so therefore she needs to uh, undergo mastectomy. But the surgeon in this case, um, uh, because the MR only showed enhancement in this one area, felt comfortable, and it was high-grade DCIS, just taking out that area and got negative margins. Um, and um, so she's being followed now uh, with screening MR um, since her second um, surgery where um, she was, because she strongly wanted to keep her breast. And um, so, so the take home I think here is that if you're thinking about screening these women for a personal history of breast cancer, I think it's very important to have a preoperative MR if you are going to um, consider um, in the future that you, because you need a historical um, exam to compare with. Um, the group in, in Seattle at University of Washington found a similar uh, increased cancer yield in patients with a personal history of breast cancer. Uh, here they had a 3% uh, percent, uh, uh, cancer yield and, um, whoops, here we go, whoops. And they also had a similar PPV um, with a personal history. Uh, of breast cancer. So as Alex already said, the risk of recurrence is complicated and I think um, not all people who have had breast cancer are equal. Um, we can't sort of just lump all of the patients with personal history in one uh, group and say that there's only one recommendation for that group of patients. Um, if they had breast cancer early at a younger age, um, they're a much higher risk of um, a second primary. Um, the surgery that they had performed um, may indicate whether or not they're at a higher risk and also whether or not they took uh, tamoxifen or not, and whether they ac actually took tamoxifen and stayed on that five years of tamoxifen. As it has been pointed out already, tamoxifen is a very difficult, um, uh, s for some women, a difficult uh, drug. So um, this was, I was very happy to see this study um, come out, and it came from the Dana-Farber uh, radiation oncology uh, group. And they actually looked at, they tried to get to the a model to figure out who with a personal history of breast cancer is at high risk and would qualify for that 20% or greater uh, um, um, uh, a cutoff for screening MR. So they looked at women uh, who were not BRCA carriers. Uh, they looked at the age that the woman was diagnosed. They looked to see whether they were on tamoxifen treatment, and they looked at the overall mortality of the type of cancer that was initially um, diagnosed. And this is their; these are their results. And I think this table is sort of the guts of the talk. And I think it's it looks complicated, but it really isn't, because basically what it's saying: anyone in blue here reaches 20% or greater and should be screened with um, breast MR. Anyone in red definitely does not. Um, and so they, they probably don't benefit from screening MR. And if you look at this table, some trends sort of become apparent. So if you look and you see, if you are 50 or younger when you're diagnosed with breast cancer, it doesn't matter if you are 
um, took tamoxifen or you didn't take tamoxifen or if you're ER positive or negative. That, none of that really makes any sense. It, does, it doesn't even matter about the mortality risk. You will benefit for, from probably screening MR. So um, I, I think, you know, if you want to make a um, cutoff for does this patient sitting in front of me um, ben would benefit from screening MR, um, the first thing to look at is the age. If she's over um, 65, probably no, no benefit of breast MR at all, okay? So between 50 and 60, it gets a little bit complicated. And a lot of that's going to depend on um, whether or not they had tamoxifen treatment. You can see that with tamoxifen on board, uh, many of them don't reach that, um, that high enough risk for um, screening MR. If they didn't have tamoxifen um, and they have a um, low mortality uh, risk with their cancer and therefore are going to be, um, you know, survive longer, then yes, they may qualify for breast MR. So it becomes on a case-by-case -case basis. But I think this makes, it sort of simplifies the, the, um, the thinking, and particularly with respect to young patients who are diagnosed with breast cancer, they're the real ones who could benefit, I think, from MR screening. And this is just another table that shows, here's that 20% uh, lifetime risk of breast cancer, and you can see that, um, that these, um, these are the patients here at this age um, uh, who would benefit from breast MR. And you can see women um, with mastectomy, whether or not they got tamoxifen or not, um, are below that risk. So the question is, is this um, cost effective and um, would this um, be uh, accepted by patients who are uh, breast cancer survivors. And there's really no actual data. The data I just showed you, that's just modeling of risk. But, um, but Ellen Warner in Toronto, who's done a lot of uh, screening in the BRCA patients, particularly, um, um, has written quite a bit about screening MR in the personal history of breast cancer and um, has been uh, wanting to start a randomized control trial uh, with or without um, breast MR for a long time. I don't know if it will ever get off the ground or whether it will be helpful. I mean, it will ever happen. But I think in the, in the meantime, until we have hard data from a randomized control trial, I think we can kind of use um, what I just showed you um, to, to help us. Now, um, this does not apply, obviously, in mutation carriers, and I think um, it was interesting um, to hear here in Switzerland um, for BRCA patients that they would prefer to undergo the um, surveillance option uh, rather than the bilateral mastectomy option. It is completely the opposite in where I practice in New York. If patients get um, uh, diagnosed uh, with um, a... Uh, 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 breast cancer and then um, they have a genetic test and it comes back as BRCA1 or 2 positive, um, they pretty much always get um, bilateral mastectomies. And a lot of it has to do with this, um, the fact that um, in the ipsilateral breast um, you can see the um, relapse-free survival is quite low um, in the ipsilateral breast and it's quite low and, and, it's, and in the contralateral breast it's also quite much lower as well as compared to just um, uh, your sort of garden variety um, uh, breast cancer. Um, so the question often um, becomes, um, well, okay, so the patient's had breast conservation uh, therapy, when should I start screening her? Um, and basically, there's no point in screening her if you have a preoperative MR and everything looks fine. You can wait for a whole year until you do um, your next MR uh, for screening. And um, cystic changes um, within treatment, you can see um, background enhancement and cystic changes often are decreased um, due to chemotherapy effects. 
Uh, you're going to see edematous changes, seroma, skin thickening, and the treated breasts, they all look benign. You, generally, there's no problem in interpretation. And you may see at the lumpectomy site um, some enhancement, but as long as it's thin and it's rim enhancement, it's um, easy to interpret. And um, it's a very um, classic sometimes to see um, areas of fat necrosis. And this is an example of an evolving postoperative change here. Here is the lumpectomy cavity, nice thin rim enhancement around it. And um, it still has fluid within it. Here's a clip. And here's two years later. You can see this cavity has collapsed on itself. The fluid has um, resorbed, but you still have that granulomatous tissue around the cavity that's still enhancing. Um, and, but having this comparison examination, it's easy to say that this is just all post-operative change um, with um, retraction of the um, cavity. Post-radiation enhancements usually resolved by a year, but you're going to see um, edema and skin thickening persisting. Um, diffuse enha enhancement may be present, but it's really not a suspicious finding. Okay, so I just want to now just sort of shift gears a lot and um, just talk about why MR may be helpful in the in the patients with breast um, conservation therapy, because I don't know if if it's always been my um, feeling, and when I interpret these things, that, um, that, and we know from surgical data, that when patients recur, or when they have a second primary in the ipsilateral breast, it's very often close to where the lumpectomy site was. And these, I think, illustrate very nicely recurrences. Here's the lumpectomy site here. Here's a, a, a quote recurrence, or a sec I should say a second primary in the breast, because after two years, it's probably a second primary. But here's the lumpectomy site, lumpectomy site, and here's the um, new cancer, lumpectomy site here. This one's in another quadrant. But, but I, I just observed that there's often this very close relationship to where the surgery was and where the, the new primary is. And um, it's always been said, well, it just is assumed that, well, that's because it must have been incompletely excised or there was residual cancer at the time of surgery that never got treated. And there's an, a new theory that um, a couple of people at our institution are promoting, and this is um, Juan Massagay and Larry Norton, and it's this idea that actually breast cancer is a dynamic process. It just doesn't happen in one place in the breast. So what happens is that actually cells may break off from the primary tumor in the breast, they can get into the systemic circulation and go and perhaps be harbored somewhere else in the body, in the bone or some other organs. And then these cancer, these cancer cells can not only break off and go back, but they can reseed the primary site where the primary tumor was. And not only can it get into the circulation, but these cells can also um, leave the primary tumor and go to other close areas within the breast. Um, and I think MR sometimes shows us this self-seeding um, that happens. And this is an example here. Here's the primary tumor. Here's, you know, a little satellite lesion over here that may be um, self-seeding um, from this, uh, this primary um, site. So it, it kind of makes sense that maybe in these recurrence cases here that these tumor cells have gone off to another part of the body and that they have come back at a later point in time and have reseeded this area. And for whatever reason, this area of the breast is hospitable to these tumor cells to set up shop and grow in this area. So it may actually have more to do with the microenvironment in this area that actually allows cancer to grow rather than thinking of it as just incompletely excised tumor. Now, it's, it's a hypothesis. It's been shown to happen in um, mice, um, but it hasn't, you know, obviously been proven in um, humans, but it's a very interesting theory, and I think that it explains a lot of what we see, perhaps, on MR. Like, for example, when we see something like this, and we see a lot of um, 
um, uh, cancer that's not contiguous um, in the breast, perhaps these are the self-seeding types of breast cancer. And we know um, that, that, that there are certain types of phenotypes and tumors that can be, um, can accelerate tumor growth, angiogenesis, and um, these are the bad actors um, of um, breast cancer. So, and we, here's another example of um, that whole, pro possibly that process with, um, with uh, um, self-seeding. So, um, it's very different than these kinds of cancers that we often see, which probably are the non-self-seeders. They don't, um, uh, go in the breast, and they probably have a, lo a better long-term prognosis, and they likely will respond well to neoadjuvant chemotherapy, as we discussed the other day. So, so sort of just interesting ideas. But anyway, in summary, I think um, women with a personal history of benefit may benefit from annual screening MR, particularly if they're younger than 50 years at diagnosis, between 50 and 60. I think it's going to depend on um, whether or not they're on tamoxifen or not, but if they're not, they should probably have a, a breast MR. It um, should be done on a case-by-case -case basis, but we really do need randomized control um, trial data. And thank you.